down much more quickly. And let's get the slideshow set up from current slide. And I will make the last announcement. Um, actually, I thought second mini term started Monday. It didn't. That was the last day of first mini term. Because my only mini term class was to teach Thursday. I knew we ended on Thursday. I just thought Monday Wednesday had already ended. They did. They ended yesterday. Which means yesterday was the first day of second mini term, meaning today, the first day of the Monday Wednesday second mini term. And that's what put me way behind this morning. I had students classes moving, classes being canceled, students not knowing where to go. You know, I was tied up for about twenty or thirty minutes at the beginning of the day trying to help students that were wandering around the halls lost and confused. So things like seems like things have settled down now. But anyway, that thing I was talking about, the midterm progress reports, we probably have until next Monday to get those in. I don't know for sure. I'll have to check on that. Usually give us a week after the uh, after mini term. After the new term begins. Okay, so that's that. Number two, my office hours have now changed. Only slightly. Monday, Wednesday stayed the same. But still, you know, 11, 15 to 12, which isn't very long, but then 3, 15 to 5, 15 in the evening. That's my biggest chunk of Monday, Wednesday. That didn't change. But my Tuesday, Thursdays did change because my first mini term class started at 12.30. The second mini term physical science starts at 1.15. The automotive students are taking that. And they can't get over here until 1.15. So, what that means is my office hours on Tuesday, Thursday have now gotten bigger from 10.45 to 1.15. So, that's a bigger chunk for me. Of course, that means I stay later on, on Tuesday and Thursday. But that's the side point. All right. Any questions for anything we've done so far? Okay. Where we left off last time, we were doing the problem that had to do with this figure, I think. Okay? And it was example six, and we had done the A part. Okay? What we didn't have time to finish was the B part. It said, what is the stone's maximum height, and when does it reach that height? So it's two parts here. Um, let me get my pen changed to dark. Okay? What is the maximum height and when does it get there? Okay, two questions. What is the stone's maximum height and when does it get there? Now, just a little bit of refresher here. What we're doing is uh, the motion under the influence of gravity. So, let's go back and write that down. It's S of T, which is the uh, The height is S of T. I was trying to find that. I knew it was that, but I wanted to make sure I found it in the book. That's on page 145, um, motion under the influence of gravity. The height S of T, okay, is equal to S0, which was the initial height. We'll get to that in a second. We already did this part. Plus V0T, where V0 is the initial velocity. Okay. Minus one half g t squared, where g is the uh, acceleration due to gravity. Okay, so that's the formula we're using. Our problem stated: a stone is shot with a slingshot vertically upward 
with an initial velocity 50 meters per second. I think. Lost it. Yeah, 50 meters per second. So V0 is 50 meters per second. Okay? From an initial height of 10 meters. So your S0 is 10 meters. Okay? Why this keeps advancing, I don't know. And they've already told us that G was 9.8 meters per second squared. Acceleration due to gravity in the SI unit. Metric units. Okay. So we already did the A part. We're now into the B part. When do you reach the maximum height? What is true about the maximum height? Can you tell me? Well, the maximum height is reached when the... All you can tell me from this figure is there it is. But how do you get that? What is true about the maximum height? Think about this. You throw the stone or shoot the stone with the slingshot into the air. Say that one more time. Exactly. Okay. And what is it on this graph that lets you know where your maximum height is? Notice we did it when Q was equal to 2 and we had a positive velocity here. We did it at t equals 7, this was the a part, we had a negative velocity there. That means the stone was on its way down. So what, what's true about it at the maximum height? What was the velocity? And what was the constant amount of energy? It's not really constant, it's, uh, I know what you're talking about, the distance up is increasing, 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 and stops and starts decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. That's the maximum height. But what's true about the speed there? The speed is positive going up, getting less and less and less. It's negative coming down, getting greater and greater and greater. What was true about its maximum height? The speed. To negative. So what is the number that goes from right when you go from positive to negative? What number do you pass? Watch until five. Five to five, getting less and less and less, less and less and less until the speed gets to be. And then it starts going negative. Same thing here. The velocity is zero. Well, they already gave you the velocity, but we don't need them to give us the velocity. We can calculate the velocity because velocity is V of T. But V of T is exactly dS dT. That's your velocity, is your change of uh, your first derivative of your displacement. And the first derivative of S0, because that's a constant, is zero. Gone. First derivative of V0t is V0. Minus first derivative of one half gt squared would be two times one half is one gt. Now they gave you that, but we could calculate it here. So where this is equal to zero, that's going to give you your maximum height. Well, we know that the V0 is 50 meters per second. We don't need to have the units here, but I'll put them in for now. Minus 9.8 meters per second squared times T, and that's equal to zero. We'll solve that. What I would do is multiply the minus, I mean, move or add the nine, negative 9, add the 9.8 T to both sides, and that would give you 
t is equal to 50 and divide by 9.8. And actually, we're going to answer the first question, the second question first. When you do that division, punch it in on the calculator, 50 divided by 9.8, you're going to get, or at least they do in the book, so we'll take your word for it, approximately 5.1 seconds. That's what they show here. Yeah, that looks pretty reasonable. 5.1 seconds. Now, if you're not certain the units are right, remember the 50 was meters per second. The 9.8 was meters per second squared. Well, obviously, the meters can divide away. One of the S's goes away, and that leaves you 1 over 1 over a second, which is the same as 1 over 1 over a second is 1 times second over 1, which would be second. So sure enough, the units are right, 5.1 seconds. All right, so we answered the first question, the second question first, when does it reach that maximum height at t equal 5.1 seconds? Now to get the maximum height, what is a stone's maximum height? We plug that 5.1 back into our original equation, which was s of 5.1 would then be, goodness gracious, okay, S of the, would be 10 meters plus 50, and that would be meters per second, times your 5.1 seconds, I'm sorry, I put the parentheses too soon, Okay, 5.1 seconds. Uh, yuck. Pen won't come on. There it goes. 5.1 seconds minus one half of 9.8. By the way, that's meters per second squared times 5.1 seconds squared. Okay. So you need a calculator to do this. I don't have one in here with me. But I can do the first one pretty easily, 10 meters, okay? And then the per second and second cancels out, okay? And multiplying 50 from 5.1, that would be plus 5 times that would be 5. 255 meters, because the seconds cancel out, minus, now one half of 9.8 would be 4.9. Here's where I'll need calculator help. Minus 4.9 times 5.1 seconds squared. Okay. So, By the way, the 4.9 was still meters per second squared. And when you square the meters, that's going to go away. And the second squared down here is going to go away. Say again? That's the whole thing after you've done it all. 240.1, you said? Okay, let's just round it to 240. 240 meters. Boy, that's pretty high. Whoa, that's not what I get, but not what they got. Okay. Uh, let's see. 10 plus, yeah, it, it can't be, because this is going to be greater than that. It's 10 plus 255 minus 4.9 times 5.1 squared. Oh, 5.1 squared. Yeah, yeah. 5.1 Okay, let me put just a second. Boy, this eraser is very slow. Okay, and what did you say it was? 0.551. Let's just round it to 138. Okay, meters. 
about 138 meters. They rounded to 137.6. Here's the reason I rounded less than they did. What were we given in the problem? At most two digits. You got even say one. That's at most two digits. That we only need is two digits. So how can we get any better? We can't even get three. We should round to one forty. Okay, but I'll round to one thirty eight. They round to one thirty seven point six. How do you get four digits precision when you only have two digits that you can't really do it? So it's missing digits we really should say <coughs> hundred and forty meters. About hundred and forty meters. Okay. All right, I'll continue. Okay. Um, now, it says how important are units. I threw the units in here, not realizing they were going to do this. In September of 1999, the $125 million Mars Climate Orbiter spacecraft burned up in the Martian atmosphere before completing the scientific mission, according to Arthur Stevenson, NASA Chairman of Mars Climate Orbiter Mission Failure Investigation Board in 1999, the root cause of the loss of the spacecraft was the failed translation of the English units into metric units in a segment of the ground-based navigation-related mission software. Someone made a unit error that cost them $125 million. Units are important, really important, okay? Uh, so, anyway, nice little quote there. They say, example seven is find the initial conditions. Now, This is going to be have to do with the problem we're dealing with, but I hate that they got it here, but since we'll use it later, we'll, I'll go to the screen. What is the initial velocity? So we're looking for V0. What is the initial velocity required for a bullet fired vertically from the ground to reach a maximum height of 2 kilometers? So a bullet fired from the ground is going to go up, and the max height, uh, we'll call it S0, is 2 kilometers. Okay, 2 kilometers. And we're looking for the maximum velocity to reach a maximum height of 2 kilometers. Okay, now, Obviously, we use the same formula as we did before, that the S of T is equal to S0, which in this case we're going to assume, I'm sorry, that's not S0, S max, S max of 2 kilometers. S0 plus V0T, because 0 is initial, not final, okay, or not max, okay, minus 1 half GT squared, okay. Now, we assume this is going to be 0, okay, and we want this maximum uh, height. Okay, S max. Okay. Well, are we we know what this is going to be, two, two kilometer. This is going to be, this is what we're looking for. This is the unknown here. Okay. We know this. Okay. We don't know time yet. Okay. So what we're going to have to do here is go to our velocity equation, which we do know. V of t um, 
And I'm going to call that M, but not for max. It's not maximum velocity, but it's the velocity where it reaches the maximum height. That's what the M stands for. Not for maximum velocity. Maximum velocity is whatever you fired it with. Okay, that's not what. Right. This is the velocity when it reaches maximum height. That's going to be, uh, we know already, V0 minus GT. We know that. And we also know that's going to be zero. Okay? Now, that tells you you reach the maximum height at time t is equal to v0 over g. Add the gt to both sides and uh, you get gt is equal to v0. So t is equal to v0 over g. Okay. Now, if you plug that back into this equation, this is where you're going to reach maximum height, then you get the S max, that maximum height, uh, is going to be, we're assuming the S0 is 0, you're firing from ground level, uh, and that's going to be V0 times v0 over g, that's your time, okay, minus one half, 9.8, we know what that is, I'll just write it in here, times t squared, so t squared would be v0 squared over g squared, okay, so I think I'll go back and take out the 9.8 and just put g. Okay, now, amazingly, things simplify pretty drastically here. Your S max, which we know, 2 kilometers, is equal to V0 squared over G over 2G. Because this is V0 squared over G, this is mi one, minus 1 half V0 squared over G. And that's going to be v naught squared over g. Oh, yeah, one half v naught squared over g. Okay, or v naught squared over two g. So the v naught squared is going to be two g times s max. We know what that is. That is your two kilometers. So now, here's the problem, folks. G, we know, is 9.8 meters per second squared. The maximum height is in uh, kilometers. You have to change that to meters so everything will be in the same units. So, of course, 2 kilometers is 2,000 meters. So this will be 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times your 2,000 meters. Two kilometers is 2,000 meters. Kilo means 1,000. Okay? And here you're... Oh, sorry. Made the wrong mark there. Okay. What this gives you is four thousand times 9.8 so that's going to be a zero zero four times eight is 32 carry a three four times nine is 36 with three is 39 39,200 meters squared per second squared so what you have to do at this point is take the square root okay because this is v naught squared is that, so you take a square root. Now, uh, Nicole, by the way, I forgot to mark it wrong. Yeah. Nicole's the only one here so far. And she just jumped out and left the calculator conveniently sitting here. I threw it, which will be to you. So we'll take. Uh, 
and route through three nine two zero zero and then type the server. may carry more decimal places than that. Don't think it's necessary. So your V naught, which is what we're looking for, is approximately, what did I say, 300, no, 198, wasn't it? I have a good memory. It's just real short. 198 meters per second. That's two, almost 200 meters in a second. What does that mean? That is traveling two football field lengths in a given second. Yeah, in any second. That is moving. Yeah, about 198 meters per second. Uh, in re reality, initial velocity would have to be considerably greater to overcome air resistance. Because that would be if there was no air resistance. You know a bullet moving anywhere close to that fast is going to be a fair amount of air resistance. Even though bullets are aerodynamically shaped and they basically have a spin to them, which helps them move through the air better, you still have a lot of air resistance. Okay. This was the formula we used uh, after a while. They plugged in a bit faster than we did. Here it is that S max, maximum height, is equal to V squared over 2G. And when you plugged in the values, that would be 2,000 meters. That would be your maximum height equal V squared over 2 times 9.8. And that's the rest of it we, we did just as shown. One little blurb before the end, maybe a little more than one. Galileo. Now, he's mostly known for his physics, okay? But since he's listed here in the book, given a perspective, remember, this cannot be your source. You can use this as an idea, but you'll have to go get your source elsewhere, okay? Um, but he discovered some of these are a laws of motion. In fact, the law of inertia was mostly his. He did do a lot of stuff with gravity and other things, acceleration due to gravity, those types of things. Isaac Newton came along. Actually, Newton was born the year or the year after Galileo died, and so it's almost like they had a tag team on his way out, Newton's way in, uh, taking over for him, but it took many years for Newton to grow. But uh, basically... Uh, Newton built on what he did. And there is a figure here showing Galileo's method. Well, no, it isn't. Um, the one in the text is sort of a a drawing of something like what he used, but he used something much, much bigger, mostly because he didn't have a good way of measuring time. So he couldn't measure time very precisely, so he measured over a longer time period and came up with some pretty good, uh, reasonably good numbers. Okay, I don't know if blowing this up will help it any. I will blow it up, just maybe can see it at home a little bit better. It's so dark, it's hard to say, okay? Uh, but just looking at this, I'm assuming, and that's probably not a good thing to do, this is several 
meters long, it appears to be. And notice the gates through there. That's an interesting way to approach the problem. Okay. That ends the uh, slide set for chapter or section 3.4. Okay, my head is clogging up pretty badly. Uh, Nicole had to step out. I think I'm going to step out too and see if I can go get me, uh, <clears throat> clear my head. So I'm going to put this on pause. And I'll pick All right, <clears throat> sorry I had to <clears throat> step out. Still not cleared, but uh, at least I cleared up some of my head a little bit. My throat's still not very good. Let's do the preliminary questions at the bottom of page 147. If anyone were here, I'd ask if there are any questions, but no one's here, so it's just me. So which, of, which units might be used for each rate of change? Paul, I know Nicole has a book. I'm pretty sure that Richard does. Samaria, I think does. And I think all three of you have a book. So I'm just going to read these uh, and not write them down because it just takes so long to write. So which units might be used to, for each rate of change? The A one. The pressure in atmospheres in a water tank with respect to depth. The pressure in atmospheres in a water tank with respect to depth. Okay? Now, atmosphere is at least to me seems like pretty much of a U.S. customary type system. Don't know for sure that it is, but it seems like to me it is. So I'm going to guess that you would be measuring the depth in, say, feet. So if you were, then the rate of change of that, say if the water was coming out, the pressure in atmospheres in the water tank with respect to depth, or if you're just going deeper as you go, then that would be atmosphere per meter. That, to me, would be the reasonable uh, uh, units for that. Let's see what they say here. 3.4 preliminary questions. Get back here in the back. Yeah, well, they said atmosphere per meter. Okay? I was guessing they were using U.S. customary feet. So they said, I said atmosphere per foot. They said atmosphere per meter. Fine. If they were using meters, I would think they would be using kilopascals rather than atmospheres, or pascals anyway. All right, let's do number B. The rate of a chemical reaction that's changing concentration with respect to time with the concentration in moles per liter. So if you're talking about the rate of change, okay, I'm going to take a little time out now. If you'll turn on the second switch. Turned it off. I had to go down and clear my head. Second, no, the other one. Yeah, flip it. Yeah, good. I'm fine. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll use your calculator for a minute. So, uh, let's do that last problem. I just turned on the projector. No, that's no, fine. Um, Sorry about that. But uh, I did see Miss, when I went down uh, the hall to the restroom, as I came out, I saw Miss Chisholm. And she said that if you go online, okay, you know how when you go to the Lawson State webpage, you have a series of blue tabs at the top, maybe two rows off. And then over near the right hand side, you have a big yellow tab, or a gold tab. It says quick link. If you click on the quick link, then she said look for graduation information. I think it's what she said, look for it there. And you'll see everything they went over at the meeting. And I think she said she's still going to put one more thing up there. So if you check it right today, you'll see something. But if you wait a couple of days, you'll see some other information there. So keep checking that. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. And uh, and then uh, if you have any questions, check at the records I'll, office. I'll right. Okay. All righty. No, we can pull up. All right, I just lost my only student of the day. Uh, she had to go. She was having some health issues. So I'll uh, continue here. We just were talking about uh, 1B on preliminary questions. The rate of a chemical reaction that's changing concentration with respect to time uh, with the concentration in moles per liter. So they basically almost gave it to you. Changing concentration would be moles per liter with respect to time would be per second, especially if this is a rapid change, rate, time change. Uh, you know, if it was a very slow reaction, like maybe iron turning to rust, you might sue per minute, per hour, per day, per week, you know, or something else. But I'm pretty sure they're talking about uh, moles per liter per second. Let's see if that's what they meant. Uh, moles per, ha! <laughs> they did per hour, okay, moles per liter, hour, or, and by the way, those are the same unit. I'll write this down for you. Uh, they did moles per liter per hour. You could write it that way, or you could write it as moles per liter per Per hour, you could write it linearly like that, or as they did, moles per liter hour. Okay, there should be a dot in between there. Okay, liter hour. Okay, that's how they did in the back. Okay, any of those are acceptable. Okay, that was number one, just dealing with units, which they don't usually do very much, but nice for them to do it. So here we have number two, two trains travel from New Orleans to Memphis in four hours. The first train travels at a constant velocity of 90 miles per hour. When you see MPH, don't assume that's meters per hour, that's miles per hour, it's just a shorthand. But the velocity of the second train varies. What is the second train's average velocity during the trip? Well, if they both take four hours, the first one is constant velocity of 90 miles per hour. The second one has variable speed. The second train still got to average 90 miles per hour to make it in four hours. So there's not much to do on that except just reason your way through it. And that would be, that uh, better be 90 miles per hour is the average. Let's see. Yeah, that's what we got in the back. Good for that. Number three, estimate F of 26, assuming that, okay, I think I'll clear the board here. We're looking for F of 26, at least an estimate for that, okay? Given that, or assuming that F of 25 is, well, so, 43, and F prime of 25 is 0 0.75, okay? Well, what does F prime of 25 mean? How does F change per whatever your unit the 25s are in? Per unit, that's what it stands for. So if indeed that's what's happening, and F prime is 0.75, then a good estimate for, for F of 26 would be 43.75, okay? Because it's increasing by 0.75 per unit, so one unit later it should be pretty close to 43.75, okay? And that's what they have in the back too. Not maybe exact, but it's a good estimate, okay? Now, number four. 
again. I think I'll erase what we've got and go to, this has two parts. The population P of T of Fredonia, sounds like they made up a name, in 2009 was 5 million. Okay, so population of Fredonia in year 2009 was... 5 million. Okay, 5 million. What is the meaning? The A question said, what is the meaning of P prime of 2009? And my interpretation of that would be how the population is changing over time. That's what you would be. That's your derivative. So she says your independent variable there is in years. Okay, I would say it means the change of population per unit year, per year. Okay, so that would be my guess on that. That's the A part. The B part says estimate P of 2010 if P prime of 2009 was 0.2. Now, here's an assumption here. Since they said 5 million, we're going to assume P prime is in a tenth of a million. Two tenths of a million, okay? So then the estimate would be 5.2 million, okay? If that's how much it's changing per unit length of time, which we assume here is a year or something about like that, then uh, that would be 5.2 million. Let's see if that's what they got. Uh, P prime measures the rate of change of population. Uh, in that year, and the B part would be 5.2 million. Good for them. Okay, homework exercises in 3.4. Any of the odds, 1 through 7, do either 9 or 11 or both. And then I think we did these, uh, said these before. Any of the odds from 13 through, it's a whole parcel of them. Thirteen to thirty-seven. Now I wouldn't just do one or two. I would read through several of these, and especially if there are any that really pique your interest, do those. If there's any that look like they might be pertinent to your major, definitely do those. And if there's a bunch that you go in a row that you don't either have interest or you don't think they're anything to the major, do one every now and then just to make sure that you're understanding what's going on. Okay? Then do any of the odds 39 to 45. And then you can read 47 uh, and uh, think through it. Okay. Now, I'm going to back up just a moment here. There's a lot of really interesting problems here. Okay, and that's why I said read several of these. Read through probably most of them just to see, because I've already noticed a couple of places where they're talking about something that's really physically pretty important. All these things are, but they're, some of them are kind of made up problems. Um, Okay, here number 31. By Faraday's law. Okay, now Faraday was mostly a physicist. However, since they're mentioned here, you can either write on Faraday and the mathematical things he may have done, or on Faraday's law and talk about how it uses calculus and explain how it uses and, and give examples, that kind of stuff. Then in 32, you see Ohm's law. And again, Ohm was a physicist, but if you want to dig into him and see things that he did mathematically, you can certainly do that. Thank you for coming. I get so bored talking to myself. 
Um, Nicole was here earlier, but she had to leave. She had a medical issue come up, so I had some company for a little while. Recently, I've been just talking to myself. Just wonder about my memory. But anyway, uh, glad you can make it. Um, and I don't remember if I went through this. I think I did before. I started the class with no one here, and then um, Nicole came in. No, I'm sorry. She was here at the beginning. That's right. That's right. It was my uh, first class. No. Uh, it was yesterday's classes, or Monday classes I had started, so I have no one here. Uh, but anyway, I did want to make sure everybody understood that. Now, are you graduating this term? Did you make one of the meetings? Today. today. Okay, I was going to say today's the last one. It's on the Birmingham campus. You knew that, like I said. All right, so you know about that. I want to make sure it's all. Nicole was not going to be able to go to the day, and she couldn't make the first two either. And I checked with Ms. Chisholm and found out and gave her the information she needed um, where to go to find it. Okay. Another thing is, yesterday was the first day of second mini term. I think I may have told you on Monday, I was thinking. Monday was the first day of second mini term, but wasn't. That was, that was the last day of first mini term. So sometime around midnight Monday night was the midterm. Okay. I'm just making that part up. So we're now into the second part of midterm. A minute, just past midterm, into the second mini term. And a couple of things with that. On the academic calendar, they say they uh, we're supposed to do midterm progress reports this week, sometime this week, or within a week of midterm. So it might go through next Monday, I don't remember. But sometimes they forget to open it up. So if they ask for them, I've got to give it. And uh, what's that? Yes, I was, that's what I was going to say. I need either your paper or your test or both if you want to find or else I've got to report a grade of failing in this one. Not that it bothers anything, it doesn't mean much, except then people will be trying to get in touch with you to see if you need counseling or, or a tutoring or other things like this. So I don't think you do, but if you do, by all means, seek that out. But uh, I just want to let you know, sometimes they forget to open them. If they do, I'm not going to do anything, but if they do open them, I've got to put something down. And this class, uh, I hate to say it, but I think it's my one and only class, full term class anyway. I don't have any scores from anybody yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, again, remember you can always ask me. I can work. I can either clarify a problem, or I can work a similar problem on the board. If I'm one in the text like it, I'll be glad to work that. Because the odds are, if you're struggling, somebody else is probably too. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, you want me to come look at it? Is that what she's. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. I thought it was a couple months ago. Right? So that adds up to zero too. 
Let me, uh, let me see if I can find one somewhere in the book. I don't, I'm pretty sure we didn't do one in classics that similar to it. I'm walking here too. Good deal. Okay. Uh, did you want to add to that discussion? <laughs> oh, okay. Which one was that? That was. Okay. Uh, okay. That was probably in. I'm trying to remember which section that would have been in. Uh, Uh, well, let's go, okay. The question was this one. Uh, it's on the test number 8A, right? The limit as H is approaching, or X is approaching H, right? I'm sorry, yeah, back. X approaching H of sine of x minus h over x squared plus 1 minus h times x minus h. Okay. Did I write it right? think so. Okay. Now, um, Samaria asked about this and she said she'd already plugged in the H equal X, X equal H, and looked at that and you got an indeterminate form, zero over zero. And sure enough, you can see that. Sine of H minus H is zero hit that zero over h squared plus h minus h squared minus h. Yeah, that adds to zero. Okay. Now, the question is, is there anything we can do to simplify? Okay. Or arithmetically deal with this. Now, one thing you might try. Okay? And this seems a little bizarre, but let's see if we can factor that denominator. Oh, I'm sorry. I had it off so my students were in here. Okay. Turn off the light, but I didn't turn on my projector. Okay. Can we factor that denominator? The, oh, okay, the only possible factorization of x squared would be x times x, right? Okay, well, we can do that. All right, then we have a minus h. Now, the only possible factorization, well, there's two possible factorizations for that. 1 times h or h times 1, 1 on positive and 1 negative. So let's do a plus 1 and a minus H. Okay. Does that make sense? So let's see if that does do it. Let's first do our multiply multiply these together. That'd be x squared, right? When you fold it. That's the first. The outer is minus hx. Inner would be plus x, and our order would be minus h, right? And if you multiply that out, you'd have x squared plus x minus h, x minus h. Yeah, that's the same thing, isn't it? Okay. Does that help him? Does it? Okay. Because now... Let me rewrite my limit. The limit 
as x is approaching h of sine of x minus h over, I'm going to do the x minus h with that, times 1 over x plus 1. Do you buy that? We said that the denominator factors the back of that. I'm going to put x minus h under this one, and then the other part of the denominator is over here, 1 over x plus 1. Does that look familiar? Yeah, we know what this goes to. And you can find that in the bottom three. And then once you've got what this one knows, then you can do the substitution for the whole thing. Right? Because the limit of a product is the product of the limit. I'll do one more step for you. Limit as x approaches h of sine of x minus h over x minus h times the limit as x approaches h of 1 over x plus y. Look up in the trig portion. You get this. But we didn't use x plus h's, x minus h's. Um, but on page 90, the sign of the limit of a state approaches zero, which is the same as x minus h approaching zero. Yeah. As x is approaching h, it's if you let, if you let theta equal x minus h, okay, uh, then as x approaches zero, theta would be approaching zero. And you see that in theorem two in the middle of page 90. You see what that limit is, and then you can plug that in there. After this chapter, what? We're in calculus now. Yeah. Oh, but limits? Yeah, limits are the sort of the building blocks on which calculus lives. Okay. So it's part of calculus, but it's not actually derivatives, it's not actually integrals, but integrals and derivatives are based on limits. So, yeah. So a lot of people say the exponential is easier than... I truly think so. Limits to me are a pain in the neck. But to define calculus properly, you've got to have them. It's... Uh, I don't know if you remember back the quadratic formula, right? Okay. Really, to prove the quadratic formula, you have to do uh, binomial expansion. You know, you have to do the, uh, what do they call that? It's completing the square. Completing the square is a pain to do. But once you've done it once with the, quadratic formula, then you don't have to go back and do it again. Same thing here. Limits are how you justify calculus. Once you got it justified, then you use it and don't have to go back and do the limits. But they spend, it feels like to me, an, an inordinate amount of time slugging you through limits, and then once you know what they are, then you don't go back and use them again. But you'll run into them again in integral calculus. So they're always there working behind the scene. So you need to sort of know what they are. Okay. 
Now, again, remember, as x approaches h, you can also count that h as theta, which would be x minus h, which approaches 0. As x approaches h, x minus h is approaching 0. Uh, but we can, and this part, you know what this part is, this part will have an h. And then if you count h approaching 0, then you should take it one more step. So take it as far as you can. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Anything else? Are you saying root as in square root? Or what, what are you saying? Oh, 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 okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. The polynomial has a root meaning a solution. And, and which of the following integrals? Okay. And that's the intermediate value theorem, which is 2. Point, what is that? 7 or 8? No, 2.8, I think it is. Yeah, intermediate value theorem. That's what you use for that. And basically, not wanting to give it away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here's another word for root. A zero. Does that help? Okay, because basically what that one is, is P of X equal X cubed minus X minus 5. Okay, nothing we've done so far enables you to solve that. Okay, but what the question is, where, uh, in which interval might it have a root? Okay. And it gives you some intervals. And I'm going to say A, B. Okay. You can put any of the two numbers in there. If you do P of A, you're going to get some number. Right? Remember, A is some number. You plug that in, it'll get a number. It's going to be either positive or negative. Right? Just make a guess. Positive or negative? Positive. Okay. And then if you plug in P of B... That's going to give you a number, right? A different number, probably. And tell me whether you think that's positive or negative. Positive. So if that was indeed positive, then that tells you in between A and B, there's, you cannot say there's a root there. Because you see the function was positive at A and also positive at B. No guarantee it ever crossed the x axis. Now, if this was positive at A and negative at B, then it had to cross somewhere. That's a, that's a polynomial function. Polynomial functions have two features. They're smooth, doesn't matter here, but they're continuous. That does matter. If they're continuous, you can't get from here to there without crossing the x-axis. It's got to have a zero there. It could get from here to here and not cross the x-axis. You can't say it has a zero there. So basically what you do is test each of those pairs and see if it's positive on both sides, negative on both sides. Can't tell anything there. But if it's positive here and negative there, yeah, it had to have a zero. Negative here, positive there, yeah, it had to have a zero. Positive, positive, or negative energy, you can't tell. So that's what you do. That's all you have to do on that. It's intermediate value. Okay? Is that helpful? Okay. And I don't remember for sure if there's one or more than one answer to that. Uh, it indicates it's probably only going to be one, but I can't say that for sure. But try them all and make sure. Okay. Good deal. Is that what you need? Okay. Okay. Now. 
what I think I'll do here. I forgot where I was. Okay. What I was saying when you first came in, I had just finished 3.4, so you'll have to listen to on YouTube, and it hopefully will be up there sometime late this afternoon. Okay? Hopefully I'll get it ready. But what I was doing after I made the homework assignment, I was saying, but notice here, and I, get, I started going through here because there's a whole bunch of problems here, and I mentioned 31, let's talk about Faraday's law. Now this is a calculus class, Faraday is mostly a physicist, but I bet you he used mathematics and calculus when he came up with this, so if you wanted to write on him and his use of calculus, that would be fine, or if you wanted to write on Faraday's law and how it used calculus, then that would be fine too. 32 was Ohm's law, and again, Ohm was a physicist mostly, but surely he used math, specifically calculus, so if you want to use how calculus was used either by Ohm or in developing Ohm's law, that would be fine too. Keep on reading a little ways, and uh, there's several things that might lead you to a paper topic, but I saw in number 42, which is not one you would have to do, Neither did you have to do 32, because those are evens. But that's according to Kleiber's law. I don't even know who Kleiber was, okay? Uh, he probably was an anatomist, okay? Because it's talking about metabolic rate. So this may be something right down your alley. I don't know if you're going into that kind of stuff. I know you're going into medical type field, right? So that may be something of interest to you. So you could either write in how Kleiber used mathematics, specifically calculus, or how Kleiber's law does, okay? Uh, or you don't, you don't have to do this. <clears throat> uh, there's something in there about a fruit fly. I can't even pronounce it. Drosophila fila melanogaska, or whatever it is, okay? If that's of interest of yours, maybe you can find the paper topic there. There's another one about atmospheric condition, O2 levels at Mauna Loa, Hawaii, okay? So there's a bunch of things here. Number 47, Stevens Law, okay? This is, he probably was a psychologist, but he had to use calculus probably to come up with that, so if that's of interest of yours, you could write on him and how he used calculus or how Stevens Law applies calculus, okay? Um... And then there's something else on palm trees. So my point is, you, if you just look at some of this stuff, you're probably going to find potential paper topics. Now, you may have already chosen a paper topic, but if you haven't, here's some possibilities. Further insights and challenges. Lorentz curve. Well, who was Lorentz? I bet you he was a mathematician, so you could write on him. Or what is a Lorentz curve? How did he develop this curve? What do you use the curve for? There's a whole bunch of things you can do that. And, in fact, several of the exercises go into those. But you don't really need to know that. But I'm just giving you possible paper topics. All right. Any questions? And you don't have to do any uh, further insights and challenges. But I always look there to see if there might be something you might be interested in. Oh, there's another one. Just happened to notice in 52. Zip's Law. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Uh, his study on internet usage, website popularity. So I bet you he was a mathematician. He may have been. He may have been a computer scientist, you know. But guess what? I bet you he used calculus to come up with that. So if you wanted to write on that, you could. Or what is this law and how does it use calculus? Yeah, whatever. Or applications of using calculus. So you could, there's, it's just amazing the different things you can run into there. All right. Enough of that. And I talked before y'all came in about Galileo. Uh, again, he was a physicist, but he probably used calculus. So if you can tie him in with calculus or his laws of motion, whatever, you certainly can. Einstein is mentioned here. Newton is mentioned here. 
any of them would work as well. Newton definitely was a mathematician as well as being a physicist. Einstein was more of a physicist, but he certainly knew his math too. In fact, if you do much on math of Einstein, you'll probably run into the name of a mathematician named Emmeline or something like that, Norder. Uh, incredible mathematician. She helped Einstein with his math. I mean, she was that good. Uh, and she was also, if I'm not mistaken, German. And also, if I'm not mistaken, at least half Jewish. And being a German Jew at the time they both lived, they both fled to the U.S. to escape Nazi Germany. And both of them contributed really strongly to things we did here. Both fascinating characters. Unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, Norder was, had some minor surgery. She went in for, and something went ter terribly wrong, and she died on the operating table. So who knows what all she could have accomplished. But, I mean, she had a good career, but she was ended early. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next section. All right, that was 3-4. Let's move on to 3-5. And hopefully we'll be getting away from some of the icky stuff and into more and more interesting stuff here. It'll take a minute for it to come up, but it's coming along. All right, here we go. From the current slide. Okay. Higher derivatives, so far we've done functions and the first derivatives, right? And you may have wondered, well, why do they call them first derivatives? Why don't we just say derivative? And most of the time we do, just say derivative. But every now and then you'll hear me say first derivative. Well, guess what? There are more derivatives out there than the first one. And that's what we're talking about in this section. Higher derivatives are obtained by repeatedly differentiating a function. So if you have a function y is equal to f of x, I think I've got a Go back and get my color back. Okay. Y is equal to f of x. You can take a derivative of that function. And if you do, quite often we'll say y prime is equal to f prime of x. Or we'll say dy dx is equal to f prime of x. Or df dx. I mean, you can say it many ways. But that's just the first derivative. That's going to give you a function. What if you wanted to take a function of a derivative of that function? Then we call that the second derivative. Okay? So, this is part of example one. So, I'm going to erase what I just did so that we can have the whole board here. Figure one and table one here. Actually, these are different figures and different tables, aren't they? Yuck, okay. They look sort of similar, but they are very different. So I won't do this one in the book. I'll do the one, I mean, the one on the slide. I'll do the one in the book. I think everybody has this addition. Okay. So looking at the one in the text, figure one is the table that looks sort of like this, but the scale is different. Table 1 looks a little like this, but the scale is very different. Uh, shows the number of cell phone subscribers, that C of T, that's on the vertical scale, in the U.S. in year T, okay, it's starting at 2009, okay? Then it has for 2010, 2011, and 2012, okay? It's the number of subscribers in millions. So in 2009, there are 277 million cell phone subscribers in the U.S. I wasn't one of them, I don't think. I may have been, okay. Then in 2010, it had increased to 301 million subscribers. A yearly increase of 24 million subscribers from 2009 to 2010. 2011 it had gone up to 
316 million subscribers, again an increase of 15 million subscribers. And in 2012, that had increased to uh, 326 million subscribers, which was an increase of 10 million subscribers from the previous year. Okay. Now, it says here, and you know, the numbers I just gave, the graph shows that. Only the number of subscribers, that C, which is the number of subscribers, C of T, per year. That's, that's what's given. Nothing about the yearly increase is given on the table. Again, this table isn't it, but you know, if it were, this would just show number of subscribers yearly. Okay? Years would be the same horizontal axis except for different years, 2009, 2011. Yeah. That was for this edition was done. The previous edition was done sometime earlier. Okay. Data getting a little old. Okay. Now, what does the first derivative tell you approximately? Basically, what it's telling you is how the function is increasing or decreasing. This one and the one in the book are increasing the function, and the first derivative, and this is hard to do here because this is this could, uh, it's continuous data, but it's not smooth data. Okay, but the first derivative would be approximating the tangent line graph, which, if you look at it, is pretty close to what that increase would be. The increase per year is how much this increases per year. Well, that's the slope of the line, right? Change of y and change of x. That's the slope of the line. So this is what you change there. So basically, your first derivative tells you approximately the slope, and that would just tell you exactly that. Now, this is not this graph, but the first year. Uh, would be about 24 uh, million subscribers per year. That would be the slope, close to 24 to 1. Okay? Second year, 15 to 1. Well, sure enough, the second year, the slope isn't as great as it was the first year. The third year, it wasn't as great as it was the previous two. So you're, what that tells you is that even though the function is still increasing, they're all positive slopes. They're not increasing as rapidly as they were a while ago. Okay? Meaning the rate of increase is actually decreasing. Even though it's still an increasing function, the rate at which it's increasing is really decreasing. So it sounds strange, but it's true. Okay? That is sort of what a second derivative tells you. So it says discuss c prime of t, which would be pretty close to the 24 um, million per year, 15 million per year, and 10 million per year, that would be C prime. What would be C double prime? Okay. Well, how much is the rate changing per year? Between 2010 and 2011, it went from 24 million per year to 15 million per year. That's actually a decrease in rate. Not a decrease in bones, but a decrease in rate of bones of minus 9. So that would tell you how the increase of number of use is actually declining over time. In other words, it looks like it's getting ready to level out. Don't know if it ever will. It may still be gradually increasing forever, but the rate is not going to be as great. Okay, so that's what C prime of T would be. Uh, so C prime would be positive, uh, but C prime is 
the value of it is decreasing, so therefore C double prime would be negative because the rate at which it's increasing is decreasing. Okay. So, the process of differentiation can be continued provided the derivatives exist. Not all functions have derivatives. Most of the ones we've used so far have them for a while, but sometimes they run out. Okay? Sometimes you'll have them that actually stop. So you could have a first derivative, dF dt, t was your independent variable, or they're using x, sorry. The problems were using t, but we're using x. So dF dx, and then if you took the rate of change of that, the first derivative, you would call that d2f dx squared. Okay? And that's a strange looking notation, isn't it? They put the superscript in between the D and the F in the numerator, but after the DX in the denominator. Well, here's why. What this is, you're looking at the change of the change of your first derivative with respect to that first variable. So up here, just like this one here is d by dx of the function f. That's what your first derivative is. How is f changing with respect to x? That's what that means. Well, then the second derivative, how is the first derivative changing with respect to f? So that's why they put dtf, because the d's are together here, dtf of the dx squared. That's just the shorthand, so you don't have to write all this stuff over and over again. Okay? If you took then a third derivative, you would then take another derivative of this with respect to x, and that would be d3f dx cubed. Okay? And you could do a fourth derivative, would be taking the derivative of the third derivative, which would be, I'm not writing my d's too well, d4x f d x fourth. Now not all functions you can carry that far. Others you can carry on basically infinitely. Okay? So let's do example two. I don't think example two has a table. So let's just clear this out of the way and do example two on this piece, okay? Okay, again, we're not using that. Uh, calculate F triple prime at negative one for this function. F of X is equal to three X to the fifth minus two X squared plus 7x to the minus 2. Oh, boy. It was going fine until we got there, wasn't it? What you reckon you got to do first? Before you can do f triple prime at negative 1, what would you do? Yeah, start with f prime. So let's do that. But we do f prime at x. Don't plug in want negative 1 yet. As soon as you plug in your minus 1, any time along the process, that becomes a number. And then if you went to take the next root of the number, it'd be 0. So keep the x's in there until you get to the little prime you want, then plug in the number. Okay? Okay. Okay. So what would this be? 15x to the 4th power minus... For x, no, that's a minus. It's x to the minus 2. Minus 14x to the negative 3. You're right. Okay. Well, what do we do next? Second. Second derivative f double prime of x then would be 
60x to the third power minus 4, right? Plus 42x to the negative 4. You're right. Well, that gives you your second derivative, not next. Now, don't plug in yet. You've got to go to the third derivative. Now, if triple prime of x, then will be 180x squared Second. Okay, 4 times 42 would be, it's a minus, because that's a minus sign, minus 168x to the negative 5. Now that we got alpha triple prime of x, now we plug in the negative 1. So alpha triple prime negative 1, which is what we're looking for, would be 180 times minus 1 squared minus 168 times a negative 1 to the minus 5th power. Okay? Now I'm going to clean that up just a little bit. That'll be 180 times minus 1 squared minus 168 over negative 1 to the fifth power, because I don't like negative exponents, so I'll put it downstairs. All right, you tell me what my negative one to the second power is. Is what? One. So this will be 180. Okay, how about negative one to the fifth power? Negative one. Odd powers of a negative number will always be negative. Even powers of a negative number are any number is going to always be positive. Okay? So this will be, that'll be a minus 1 in the denominator, so that'll change that minus to plus 168, and that equals what? 348. Let's see how they did. 348, they got it right. Good for them. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. That was the previous problem. So here is table two. They're picking some variable at some power, x to the fifth. And they're showing you as many derivatives as we can. If f of x is equal to x to the fifth, you tell me what L, L prime would be. Got it. What would L double prime be? 20x to the third. What would L triple prime be? 60x squared. What would, now notice here. They used the tick marks for prime, prime, double prime, triple prime. After a while, you get too many tick marks for prime and counter marks. So they start putting in parentheses four. If you see an F four there, that means F raised to the fourth power. Whatever function that is, you raise to the fourth power. If it's in parentheses there, then that's the fourth derivative of F. So what's the fourth derivative of F? 128. How about the fifth derivative of that? 120. How about the sixth derivative of that? Zero. And you see, anytime you have a polynomial power, a power, a positive power, okay, you can only take derivatives be whatever that power is plus one derivative. After that, to the zero. Actually, that derivative will be a non-zero number. The n plus first derivative will be a zero. If these are polynomials, in other words, whole number powers. That's what you've got.
just like we saw in the last example of that, with a minus 5 here, every you take that to the minus 6, minus 7, minus 30, minus 30. There's no ending to those at all. Okay. But there are for positive powers. Some point they go to zero. Basically, n steps that n is your thing. Okay? Oh my goodness. You just let me go over, didn't you? But you liked it, didn't you? Okay. Uh, we got started a little late. We'll start next time on example three. Okay. Homework exercises here. We should finish this pretty quickly next time. Any of the odds one through 15. Any of the odds 17 through 25. And let's stop there, I think, and we'll pick up from there. Okay, okay. good deal. We should finish that pretty quickly next time and move on to 3.6, the trigonometric functions. All right. Good deal. Any questions? Okay. Okay, yeah said this a little earlier. We're going to finish 3.5 next time and move on to 3.6. Then we'll do 3.7. Okay, a little bit longer. And then we'll do 3.8. And even though we'll do some in 3.9. Yeah, I think we'll do all of 3.9. No, not all. We'll do up to the hyperbolic functions. I'll tell you a little about them, but we're not going to hold you responsible for them. And then 310, I wish we had time for it, but I think we don't. So we'll stop after about midway through 39. And then I'll give you the test. Now, the better question is, when are you going to turn in the first test? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, I really do need those in soon. Either the paper or the first test. Get me something soon, like this week maybe.